Welcome to Under My Blanket, a lo-fi creation from under the surface. Every week, I will strive to dive deep into my bedsheets, pun always intended, a bizarre and comical 30-minute pondering, heroically and masterfully themed around the blanket, and in them. Hello and welcome. This is a very special edition of Under My Blanket. Uh, You are listening to your host, Miranda. This is my first attempt at coming outside uh, for uh, what I hope to be a multiple part series on picnicking. Uh, This picnic this week uh, is by myself. I am sitting in my mother's backyard. Uh, You might be able to hear some birds in the background. Uh, I currently have my mother's cat out on a leash. She's sitting in the shade of a big ash tree in the backyard of my mother's house. Um, And this is also my first attempt uh, in pre-recording where I am not going to spend a majority of my time uh, editing things together. Uh, And that is because there's a chatty, chatty bird uh, behind me. Uh, And chatty birds do not make for uh, good editing. So what you're hearing right now is unedited, which means that I might be rambling a little bit. It means that I might say um a lot, like I have a tendency to do, um, and then later edit out. Uh, but today's episode is very internal. Um, it's very much a episode that I I'm going to keep repeating the same words because that's what I have a tendency to do when I don't have a person around uh, giving me social cues to be like, Miranda, you've said that word far too many times. Uh, But it's also um, one where I'm going to go internal and do some self-reflection on how I do uh, self-care. And that's what this episode is about today. So today's episode of Under My Blanket brought to you through the facilities of CFF FM 92.7 FM in Peterborough um, Trent Radio is um, dedicated to uh, a close friend of mine uh, who recently lost her uh, sister my friend Holly uh, this past week Um, lost her baby sister after a long fight to lupus. Uh, She was about 20 years old, uh, and that girl's name is Sibet. Um, Sibet and I didn't really get to be close during the time that I've known Holly. Uh, They both live in Attawapsket, where I taught for a couple years, and I had a lot of fun times teaching Holly in the adult night classes. Uh, We became pretty close and some of my favorite memories uh, from Attawapiskat, at least my last year there, were um, the last day where we got to do a big campfire and hang out all together. And so uh, Holly and Sobet, uh, this is for you, uh, despite the fact that Uh, you might not have the chance to listen to it. Um, Monday is when Sibet is going to be laid to rest. Um, And from my understanding, uh, her body is already in Attawapiskat. So I'm hopeful that maybe the the positive thoughts and the self-care that I'm going to go through today will um, inspire, at least on a spiritual level, um, some self-care. Uh, And, of course, I'll be checking in with Holly later today just to see if there's anything I can do um, as a friend. And so, in addition to that, um, there's been a lot of suffering in in my personal life lately. There's been a lot of mourning, um, and I am hopeful that this message is finding you well. Um, I know that considering what we've been going through as a collective society all around the globe. Um, There has been a lot of mourning, um, not only in reference to 
uh, the pandemic, but in addition, in reference to um, the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, both of which has left a lot of people displaced, um, especially and disproportionately uh, Black people in the United States, um, Indigenous people in Canada, and Black people in Canada as well. And so I want to talk a little bit today about how I do self-care. And one of the things that I do um, when I'm having a particular bad day uh, is identify it. I I think that's the first step in any sort of self-care process or regimen is to realize that the feelings that I'm having that day don't have to do with any external factors. They're very internal. Um, And that's kind of the hardest part of the process in my experience. It might just be my personality, but typically when I'm going through something, I will wake up and I will be generally speaking very grumpy or reluctant to wake up. And so uh, taking the time every morning when I have the luxury of time to do so, um, which isn't always the case, uh, I will sit in my bed or sit with my dog in the living room and I will kind of go through a head-to-toe self-assessment um, and it's not always that literal I don't always go like oh how, how am I feeling physically how am I feeling mentally but uh, I will kind of uh, think through all of my frustrations and all of my feelings and then try to come to a conclusion Um, so yesterday I was feeling particularly low, um, and I feel like sometimes when I I get low, I feel selfish, uh, for feeling so low, especially if I feel like, you know, it's not my duty to, to be mourning, um, it's not, you know, my human that I've lost, though it is somebody who's close to me is human. Um, And because of that, I um, have a tendency to be a bit self-deprecating. And so yesterday I tried to remind myself um, and validate myself as much as I possibly could to say, you know, even if it isn't, you know, your close friend, your relative, uh, that that you lost, um, it was definitely somebody that was close to a lot of people that you love. And so that was the biggest struggle, was just um, coming to terms with that. Um, And I guess that process began the night before yesterday. Uh, I was lying in bed and I was kind of deciding to reflect on my relationship with Sibet and the few times that I got to meet her, uh, she she was somebody that I uh, only got to see rarely because of the fact that she was out of the community a lot with um, complications in regards to her uh, disease. And so I was trying to remember specific events and I, of course, used what the modern tools we have and went on to Facebook and uh, saw an outpouring from the community uh, around her. Uh, She was the same age as uh, my graduates uh, from the last and second last, I guess both years that I was at at Oapskat in teaching at the high school. So uh, she, she was close to a lot of the students that I came to be very fond of Uh, that I worked the most with and so just seeing how much um, she meant to them and seeing messages uh, (laughs) joking messages between her and her her close friends on Facebook really did spark up some emotions and made me very uh, emotional because I felt as if I should be there for these students that were uh, kind of like family to me 
And I know that that's not necessarily the perspective of Southern Ontario teachers. We have restrictions, um, more restrictions uh, as teachers here in Southern Ontario. Um, but because I uh, was in a small community uh, and I have the privilege of being a seemingly innocent looking uh, person and um, very well intentioned uh, and close to the community in general, um, and even just having the advantage of being there for more than one year, which is something that doesn't always happen. I, a lot of cases, actually, it doesn't. Uh, I had become very close to this, my students, and I, I honestly uh, still get messages from them uh, to this day, uh, typically when they're going through something or if they want to uh, make a joke on my expense. And so, um, seeing them remember this girl who was kind of just a joking, funny human being was very hard. Um, and I say that with, with obviously love and respect and a smile on my face because it is something that I had to kind of grieve yesterday. Um, and so what I did was, uh, I... I woke up that day and I decided that instead of recording a um, radio show where I would do research like I had been doing for the past two weeks, I would essentially um, kind of feel whatever I was feeling that day, do whatever I could to, to relax that day. Um, give myself the time and the breathing space to uh, utilize my own inner strengths and uh, that was something that I looked for in some things that I used to enjoy um, and that's definitely the benefit of having a lot of interests um, I am one of those people who will gather interests from people that I care about because one of those uh, experiences might uh, stick in my brain a little bit better. And so if I have happy memories doing something with someone, uh, I will try to recreate that magic however I can. And so uh, yeah, that... Um, has meant that I have a lot of projects on the back burner. And one of those is getting back into reading fiction. Um, so the thing that I did was I tried to find something to express my feelings uh, about Sabet and um, about my friend Holly um, and... I read through some poetry in my room, but then I found a play um, that I had meant, been meaning to read. Um, it was a gift from an ex forever ago, and I hadn't picked it up yet. Um, for those who haven't been listening, or maybe those that don't know me, I am an English teacher as my degree is in English literature, but I also have a second teachable in dramatic arts, and so... I really do enjoy reading plays that started in high school with uh, Death of a Salesman and Streetcar Named Desire, and because of the love that I had for the latter, I um, had been given a copy of The Glass Menagerie by Tennessee Williams, and so I finally got around to reading that yesterday, and I did so in my backyard, um, sorry, in my backyard, um, and... I um, read it with high expectations, which is never a good way to read a play. Um, obviously, our first attempt at anything doesn't necessarily reflect how good we are eventually going to be. And since I knew Streetcar Named Desire um, fairly well through the Simpsons adaption, uh, through like my own personal experience... Um, in high school, I acted out uh, the character of uh, the the boy that, that shows up at the end of the play that Blanche Dubois um, 
flirts with right before she gets sent to an insane asylum. Sorry for the spoilers, it is a very old book, so if you've not read it or don't know the ending, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, that's the, the ending of a uh, I've always depended on the kindness of strangers, for those of you that don't know. Um, and so what I've done, or what I did, was um, taking the time to to kind of reach... Ooh, I'm going to put a lid on a, a cup right now, just because I saw it be... Okay, sorry about that sound. Um, and so what I ended up doing was reading uh, uh, The Glass Menagerie. And I really didn't like it. Um... But that doesn't mean that it would held less value to me um, in my reading of it. Uh, I'm sorry if you enjoyed that play, but I felt like the more interesting characters uh, were not the focus in the end, and that really bothered me. Um, it also was very much a play from the times that it, it can't go, was written, and I mean, that does happen, uh, obviously, but, um, you know, the, the references to um, the mother who was kind of stuck in a similar way to Blanche Dubois in um, Streetcar, uh, stuck in this, like, perception of, like, um, young women need to marry to have protection and I mean that honestly was likely the truth of the time um, that was written but also um, this perception that um, a young woman needs to have particular skills in order to attract, attract a mate and her lack of understanding towards her daughter's disability her lack of understanding towards her daughter's um, lot in life in general and anxiety um the the daughter character in uh the play you know she she had very severe anxiety um and although that wasn't addressed as severe anxiety um it was definitely something that uh was brought up many times she as an example um decided or was forced to take a business class um, to learn typewriting, again, sign of the times. Um, so she's, she's being forced to like take this typewriter class, and then at the same time, in, in her process of, of like learning to type, on her very first day, she gets so sick uh, and so anxious, and she throws up, uh, and then she just can't come to terms with coming back, because she knows that she threw up on the floor, and people know her as that person um and she had the same reason for not being able to finish high school she had the same uh reason for um not truly being interested in anything except for these glass toys that her mom refers to as her glass menagerie um and so that character obviously is the more interesting character but the play itself revolved very much around like this brother who was you know meant to be a poet and probably loosely re related to um tennessee williams perception of himself um but you know the ending is just that he leaves much like his father does earlier and then um simultaneously in the process of leaving is um, left with like regret but not necessarily regret that turns into anything and I feel like I'm, I'm a fan of a lot of short stories and plays that don't really have a concrete ending or maybe not even a satisfying ending. ending. And I know that, um, you know, around that time period uh, with the most famous plays and productions that were on stage, a lot of them had, like, negative endings. Um, I remember being in a Trent uh, lit course that was, like, American literature. Uh, it's not American literature, like, American plays and productions and I do remember you know we we reread 
for me. Uh, Streetcar, uh, we, we read um, Death of the Salesman again as well. But we, you know, all of these different plays, like Night Mother, things like that, they, they all have this ongoing theme of, like, uh, uh, de- depressing... <laughs> Uh, t- depressingness, I guess. I, I mean, that's a, not a word. But, like, it, they, they have this, like, uh, sadness to them. They have an ending that doesn't conclude necessarily, or doesn't end in the way that you want it to end. Uh, Night Mother ends in a suicide, um, and uh, Death of a Salesman ends in a death of a salesman and so um you know there was only one play out of all of those plays that I was asked to read um which uh was Rosencrantz in Guildenstorm of Dead ironically uh not depressing (laughs) despite the word dead being in it but like uh, I was left to um expect that from the end of the glass menagerie, but not necessarily expect that it would be so um, selfish of an ending and so unclear as to whether or not he's going to go back to his sister. I believe it kind of implies that it does. You know what? I wish I had a copy of the book right here in front of me. I just realized I was like, oh, I have it. when I don't. Um, but it, I mean, ultimately, it... Um, it kind of just suggests the ending um, as being vague. And uh, what I'll do right now, actually, is even though I said I wasn't going to edit it, I'm going to do my best right now to stop. I'm going to check the time and I'm going to come back um, into the exact same place. Um, so uh, apologies for the clipping, potentially different sounds in the background. But I'm going to go and I'm going to find that play and I'm going to read the last um the last bit for you because I enjoy reading things on Trent Radio and that's another act of self-care. So I'll be right back uh, and then I'll give you a general gist of, I'll give myself a general gist of how much time I have left for the show and then I'm going to read you the end of Glass Menagerie and then just wrap up the show as best I can to talk a little bit more about self-care. So I'll be right back. So I have only about five more minutes. I'm going to take this last five to uh, finish this monologue. Uh, this is from the perspective of Tom, uh, the the son and narrator in the story, uh, who has abandoned his mother and sister, much like his father has abandoned them. Um, and this is me attempting to prove to you, I guess, that uh, I'm not crazy in saying the ending was horrible. Uh, there's also an a siren going on in the background, so maybe it's to theme, I have no idea. <clears throat> I didn't go to the moon. I went much further. For time is the longest distance between two places. Not long after that, I was fired for writing a poem on the lid of a shoebox. I left St. Louis. I descended the steps of this fire escape for the last time and followed from then on in my father's footsteps, attempting to find in motion what was lost in space. I traveled around a great deal. The city swept about me like dead leaves, leaves that were brightly colored but torn away from the branches. I would have stopped, but I was pursued by something. It always came upon me unawares, taking me altogether by surprise. Perhaps it was a familiar bit of music. Perhaps it was only a piece of transparent glass. Perhaps I am walking along the street at night in some strange city before I had found some companions. I pass the lighted window of a shop where perfume is sold. The window is filled with pieces of colored glass, tiny transparent bottles and delicate colors, like bits of a shattered rainbow. Then all at once, my sister touches my shoulder. I turn around and look into her eyes. Oh, Laura, Laura, I try to leave you behind me, but I am more faithful than I intended to be. I reach for a cigarette, I cross the street, I run into the movies or a bar, I buy a drink, I speak to the nearest stranger, anything that can blow your candles out. For nowadays, the world is lit by lightning. Blow out your candles, Laura. And so goodbye.
so that was possibly cut off there uh, by my alarm. Um, hopefully it wasn't too intrusive into the recording, or maybe you stopped being able to hear me altogether. Um, if so, I'll just have to do this part of the recording again. Um, so I guess in summary, what I'm wanting to say for this specific episode of Under My Blanket um, is that uh, trusting yourself and learning to uh, take the time to reflect um, on what you desire, what you need uh, for your week is always a good thing. And my hope is that this message reaches you uh, in a place where you're um, trying to practice self-care yourself these days. Um, that is going to be to the benefit of everybody out there. Um, even those that are um, deciding that this pandemic has ended uh, where the rest of us are kind of hiding in the shadows and waiting for an official um, source that tells us that the scientists are saying it's okay now. Um, but for those of you who are, you know, taking care of yourself like I am, and even those who are out there and um, ignoring the bad news in order to um, stay sane, do your best this week to focus on something um, that is internal, um, that is healthy, healthy, <laughs> that is helpful for you, uh, and help each other as best you can when you can. Because that's sometimes an act of self-care for me as well, is just focusing on my friends and the, the my partner and the people that I love and care for and... Um, and that's a perfectly valid example of self-care. So thank you very much for joining me this week. This has been Under My Blanket, uh, Picnic Edition, one of five. I don't know. We'll see. It's the start of summer. There's a chance that there's going to be a lot of these. Um, and maybe next time I'll be joined by some friends. Uh, we're in the talks of making that happen. Uh, maybe I'll even get to do one camping this summer. I don't know. That'll be pretty exciting if I can. Um, and have a beautiful and lovely Tuesday. Uh, thank you again to the birds that have been interrupting this radio show because uh, I hope you can hear them. They've been talking nonstop. Um, probably because I have, a, again, a cat on a leash in the backyard. Um, but they have definitely added some background spice for me. So hopefully it's for you too. Have a great day, guys. Take care of each other.